My life is for people. With the life you're living. Do you really think this world will make it? Yes. Yeah. There's no other way. Kingsley, welcome to the Awards Tour podcast. Thank you for being here. Nice to be here. I was researching your preparation for Bob Marley, One Love, and the one thing I was kind of struck by is you were kind of like, I don't want to, I want to say this, but it was like that offer that they give you for religion. They had to keep coming back to you. You know, you kept saying no at first, being like, are you sure? But I heard it was the family that really sort of made you feel like not only did you want to do this, but you had to do it. Yes, I, I never, I don't think there was a moment. Well, I don't think I said no. Not I, I no, think, yeah. but more of like, are you sure? I, yeah, it was more like it was a it was a discussion that went on over a period of months with Ray, obviously, and then the family got involved. I I sent an audition tape because everyone had to tape, and there's nothing. I was there's nothing to lose with a tape, you know. It's just a few days prep, and it's always sort of good good practice anyway. But. I was told that the family had seen it and approved it really quite early on and they wanted to to meet and to discuss it and I guess I guess what I meant was knowing that the family were involved from the beginning was the thing that allowed me to feel like oh okay it felt like there was a a real conversation to be had and obviously because it's Bob's family I just felt like I was just really interested in hearing where they were at and what they wanted to do. And then so the discussions began and I, and I ended up going to spend a bunch of time with Ziggy and Steven and met everyone and, and, uh, and then, yeah, and you go, like, I can't walk away from this because it's, it's Bob and they're saying we want you to do it. And I'm yeah. going, well, I don't know how this, <laughs> I don't know how this is going to work because <laughs> Bob and I kind of, we don't have anything really that similar in mm. terms of body size, in terms of voice tone, in terms of I'm not a musician, like I don't sing, I don't. So I really, really, I guess the idea that it is about essence yeah. was something that I really had to meditate on because otherwise I would have just freaked out. Yeah. I know that objectively when I'm looking at other people and when I'm looking at work sort of that, but when you're in it, you go, I want to, you want to do things to kind of feel more like him and, and actually what that involved was just understanding his psychology, the story, the theme and trying to build a version of Bob out of that story around that time. But yeah, the first time I met the family was, was intense. <laughs> Oh, I bet it's like this is not this is not the twenty questions you want to get. There's a lot, I'm sure, in that like almost interrogation. But it's a big family. And it's a big family. That's yeah. true. It's definitely not a small one. I think it's a testament to what you did do in the fact that like yeah, they can say maybe nice things at the premiere, but Ziggy went on the press tour with you. You're mm. like y'all did a ton of the interviews together, and mm -hmm. I think that is a testament to there's a reception to the film that you hope, but that's the reception that you definitely want. You want the people who did make you want to be a part of this, feel oh so good at it that they're they're coming out with you. How, yeah. What was that like? Oh, it was great, man. Like, I, I, I was like, I was like, Ziggy needs to be at the front of this, you know, because he was the orchestrator and he was the person in the family who was like on the front lines of it and really, you know, shaped it and put it together. And his involvement was really immense. He was there with us every day and it was not just Ziggy, but Neville Garrick, who was Bob's close friend and was on that Exodus tour with Bob and was in the room with him when Bob was composing a lot of those songs. Like wow. he saw them all come together. Not, he did the album design, co the covers for the albums, but so having Neville there and Ziggy together was such a like, was such a special thing, you know, because it was a thumbs up from Neville or you, Neville also like, saved us in a bunch of moments where he had to remember what was going on at the time. Oh, wow. And I was able to use my Sundays to like, I guess, call Neville and ask him really in-depth questions about Bob and where he was at internally, you know, emotionally and spiritually. And just trying to understand like how he really struggled and what those things were so I could kind of have a confidence in any the choices that I made but yeah Ziggy was Ziggy was with us not only just in the press tour but you know the whole time on set and as I was sort of spending those months trying to build the character he was always there and really special experience 
again, I just, I loved seeing y'all out there promoting it. And you have to play this iconic person who, one, has a ton of media out there for them. So there's definitely people that are familiar with what he looks like, sound likes, how he carries himself, but you have to make him a man that you have to just live in. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, I know you did a ton of preparation for this role and a ton of research and asked a lot of questions, but when did he become Bob? When was he not Bob Marley? When was he the character that you felt like, okay, I, I got him, I, am, I, I understand how to live in the moment within him as an actor, did you find that? When did you find that moment? I guess just before we started filming, I felt really, really confident about what Bob was going through at that time. And that morning that he woke up before the concert, all of the things that were going on around that time, all of the people coming to the house, the stakes of that concert, how dangerous it was. There were conversations around his safety. Mm. Um, so for me, the kind of, the internal mantra or theme of the movie for me was a man's lifelong search for peace. Mm whether that's inner or outer. And that's just like an acting thing where I always have to kind of find a statement to ground myself in and to put Bob in a story about a man's lifelong journey to try and find peace made sense to me. Made sense when you listen to his music, when you, and I, I think as well that statement is something that's universal. And you're trying to find something that's universal about Bob so everyone can connect with him, not playing the idea of him, not playing the revolution. You can't play a revolutionary. What does that mean? Like, to play the man. So I felt confident about that. Then comes the language. I was just about to say, man. So I felt <laughs> confident about, like, Bob's arc within the story, but then the language was just something else. And that was something that I realized a few months before that we were gonna need a lot of help and we were, gonna, we were gonna need language experts there on set. And the translation and the tweaks of, you know, the, the specifics of the patois was something that we continued to work on throughout the film. And even after the film, in post, you know, when they tested the film, there was a bunch of stuff where I was like, it sounds like Bob, but no one can understand what he's saying. And so, how much of it they could leave, how much of it we had to like readjust. And you know, it's funny because in the edit, if you understand what Lashawn is saying, every third word you'll get what I'm saying. Not every third word, but the audience can understand what Bob's Enough. saying because yeah. they understand what she said to him. Um, so all of that, the language became the biggest kind of part of it. But in terms of Bob's, his physicality and his, uh, his body language and his, his movements, that I, I was able to connect that all to the theme and the statement, which was, uh, it took a long time because you've got to translate all of his interviews that take a long time because you don't understand, I didn't understand half of what he was saying. And so, but when you listen to Bob from 1969, I think the first interview I heard all the way to 1981, what's great is he's saying the same thing. It's the yeah. most consistent, like his message and his religious spiritual beliefs kind of how he felt about the world and politics and what his uh, position in the world was and what he wanted to do. He was so strong-minded and like headshaw. And never wavering. I yeah. don't think so. Yeah. Ma maybe a little bit privately, but his public persona was really, really strong. And that's what everyone connects with. That's like, everyone thinks they know Bob because they've seen all the interviews and he's so, um, they're, they're consistent. Like mm. he, he's saying the same thing. So there were lots of things I felt really, really secure about. And like, okay, I, I feel like I understand Bob. I feel like I know him. Um, but the language became something that was very, very particular, almost, almost like shooting a movie in French and learning the French as you go with French people kind of dictating to you what the flows and the rhythms are. Because I picked up a lot, but you can't pick up everything. No, you, you have to live in Jamaica for 12 years to, <laughs> to kind of get the nuances. I don't, don't promise a good time. I'll be there. Uh, <laughs> I was going to ask you what, I'm not to cheapen every worthwhile thing that you just said about the accent, but what was the most difficult word or line? Do you recall which one you were just like, this one, this one took extra time to get down? There, was, there were a few sounds that I struggled with. Um, 
there were a few sounds, but there was, there was one line, really small thing, when Bob's calling to Aston down the stairs, and he says, Aston, what, what are you playing down there? And my intonation was going Trinidadian, and the Jamaicans were going, no, down there is, it's down there. And I couldn't hear it. I couldn't hear what they were saying. So every time I said it, the dong de would go up. <laughs> and then everybody would go, no, it's dong de. And, and, I, still, and I still can't hear it in my head because I've just got my grandma No, but you did head. it. It went up and down. Okay, okay so, yeah, you did was, do it. That took hours. And I was like, what? <laughs> what do you mean? And then I just started just doing it for the, for the musicality. And then you lose the act in it. It was just, it's funny. Sometimes it's just the smallest thing that can just cause the most problems. But it was mainly listening to Bob. So like there are a few interviews at the beginning. I was I wrote I was like, I wanted to write them all out so I could kind of learn them. And um, there was one bit where he said, "Well, man, bring a guitar to come give me one time." I guess I'd start, and I didn't know what he was saying. And he was he's basically describing where he first learned to play, and it was on Spanish Town Road and Ebenezer Lane. Well, man, bring a guitar to come give me one time. I guess I'd start. And he, he sung in a, a talent competition and he, he went up on. <laughs> but it was the way that he said it. I, I remember being on Barbie and listening to it and going, I don't know what this means. And I remember Jamaicans coming around to my house and I remember the process of breaking down all of those interviews and just my mind blowing with like, I was not only not understanding, I was misinterpreting things, like wow. massively misinterpreting things. There's so many nuances and you know, expressions and idioms. And, um, and Bob also, like, he, he spoke really specifically to just, like, the way he spoke. So a lot of people say, they don't know what Bob's saying. Like, Bob, <laughs> Bob kind of, he spoke a little bit country, and then he spoke a little bit Kingston, but he also traveled a lot. So he picked up on a lot of Americanisms and, and, and things in Europe and, and just, and he was a poet, so he invented his own I was going to say, it was always so poetic. Yeah, yeah, everything that he did was what he picked up and he liked, liked, liked the same way that you'd write your sonnets, right? Yeah. Oh. So there's some things that only Bob says, you know. There were some things in the film where people were going, that's not Jamaican, that's not Jamaican. But you listen to Bob and that's how Bob said it. So Bob said it like that. So the conversation became, do we say it how Bob said it, or do we leave it like this? And then a lot of Jamaicans are gonna think that it's not right. Yeah. And I was like, leave it, and Ziggy, leave it how Bob said it, and let people talk and say what they wanna say. I mean, y'all must have felt confident with it. You took it down to Jamaica. Like, you did the, yeah. the big moment, and so I'm sure they gave you the, this is Rotten Tomatoes, we, we don't shirk away from reasons, but I heard that people, there was always gonna be people on one side of it, but they felt credibly that y'all did a pretty great job. At least, that's what I had heard. Like, yeah. people, because trust me, the internet videos would have lit y'all up a lot worse if it was, like, really bad, because we've yeah. seen the, like, it's not like the Brad Pitt Patois from... Oh, yeah, someone, <laughs> right. sent, someone sent me that. You could have had someone that. Someone sent me that. You could have had that. Just yeah, think about I guess because I guess because people don't know you. Like, people yeah. don't know me, so they don't know that I'm never going to do that. Yeah. You know, they don't know that I've grown... People just see an actor's been cast who's not Jamaican, but they don't know that I've grown up with Jamaicans. I know what the stakes are. They don't know the work that I do. Yeah. They don't know what acting preparation is. And there was a world where, like, if there wasn't the time and there wasn't the support, I don't do the film, do you know what I mean? It's like, I don't do, like, if the wig's not right, we're not moving forwards. Yeah. If the cost, we're not moving forwards on anything. And I think that's what, I think that's what Ziggy and them really responded to. They were like, oh, this guy's, this guy's on job. Yeah. Um, and I think to play him, you kind of had to be. I'm not always like that, but I think the intensity of the pressure instead of, like, because you can't, think about it too much so it kind of transferred into the work um, and so then just the work became really intense not sustainable but glad I did it and it's over yeah and then I also read that you had to keep it kind of a secret on the Barbie set like you eventually told them right or did you not tell no, them it's you, great. no I told them straight okay I was like, you told I got, straight yeah. up but you were like prepping for it on the night yeah so like I, you were I, like in your nighttime keeping it to yourself yeah yeah no I was I told uh, Barbie knew I, I had a hard out because I needed to start prep, because I didn't play the guitar, and I was like, I need all this time to do all these things. But they were cool, they'd always let me just go back to the trailer, and like, I had so much time on Barbie to work on Bob, it, and, and then Barbie became a really positive escapism in a way. So mm. I would go and shoot the scene, and then come back and do Bob, and play the guitar, and then come back and do that, and it was really, it was a much better way 
to start the foundational steps because being at home on your own, just going around in circles watching videos and trying to, it, it's, it, you need to balance it out yeah. and take breaks. And so Barbie was just a nice comic relief. You know. I mean, y'all had so much fun. We could tell that y'all had fun on yeah, that it was one. A lot of fun. And it was it was funny too because I guess uh Inshute was prepping for Doctor Who. Is that he correct? He just found out yeah. that he'd been he'd been yeah. cast. So I was like, listen, the brothers are doing all right in this yeah. movie. Like y'all yeah. are level it up. Listen. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> this is a good time. That was big news. Yeah. Because he remember I remember he said, yeah, I remember he said Sam Big's gonna be announced tomorrow. And I was like, Wow, oh, why is it? Why is it? Yeah. He wow, smells that so good, by the way. Let me tell y'all, like, this is not He's a joke. He's a fresh guy. He is, uh, me, you know that I'm talking about. I have to talk about this as a real thing. I saw him at Comic-Con. First of all, he was at Comic-Con just, like, on the side of the street. And I was just like, this is a travesty. Do y'all know? It's, like, literally, like, but he was, like, all, like, casual with it. I walk by him, and it's, like, the waft again. And, like, I've seen was it, it in cologne? Just, yes. Like, he just smells kind of amazing. I don't want to, like, do Shampooed, a big. Shampooed, soaked, creamed, it's, and then It's cologne. a perfume. It's yeah. a perfume. Oh. And he's one of these guys that, like, when you meet him, you will smell it. And it like in good. San Diego, which is not a place where you would normally like the wafty smells, I was like, I walked past him and it was like yeah. kind of amazing. Sorry, I just have to I talk know, to Zoe. Yeah. And he's beautiful as well. So he's, <laughs> he's sort of he's attacking all your senses. <laughs> attacking all your senses. Yeah. Let's let's talk about this. So you've been Ken. And granted, uh, Bob Marley is not an American icon, but he's, I guess, a North American icon. Mm -hmm. um, you've also played Barack Obama and Malcolm X. And like, listen, <laughs> the the British actors taking American icons allegations, you might be offended number mm -hmm. one. You've done quite a few. But of those three, between Barack, Bob, and Malcolm X, which one do you look at that was the most challenging? Because I think all three are extremely challenging, but... Bob was the most challenging by far. Uh-huh. Malcolm was the most exhilarating experience mm. and going to be very, very difficult to... Like, it, what, what that movie meant at that time to me and how just the experience of that specific moment so specific it's so uh nothing can compare to it i mean i hope i, I hope there are, there are more many more experiences yeah. that are great but that was just it was just like we wrapped and then covid locked the world locked down like a week after yeah and it was such a last minute thing because andre harlan pulled out and i think then someone else pulled out and then regina had like a week or two to kind of find someone and so i slipped in and just kind of came in with work ethic and told her what I was going to do and prepped it with no time. There was no time to think. And then we just had such a good time on set because it was just 10, 12, 13 page scenes of just dialogue, you know, yeah. and, and spending the time trying to understand who Malcolm was in that moment, what he was going through with no time really to understand. It was like trying to find the information in the books and then landing on, landing on Dick Gregory. Yeah. I'm reading some interviews where Dick Gregory would speak about Malcolm and just feeling so confident that Dick Gregory's perspective was such a strong one and one that could be trusted and one that was different and one that suited the context of the film. That Malcolm was, uh, the la he said, the lacerating demagogue that we all know in those images was really only a small part of who he was. Yeah. Um, and Malcolm was a sweet, bashful man, and he'd be embarrassed if he heard us talking about him like that now. Wow. And in a lot of those moments where you see Malcolm in, his, in those moments, it's always like the day after someone from the nation had been murdered or some tragedy had happened where he was so emotional that he was kind of spurred to speak in that way. And then just the relationship with Regina on set and what a wonderful director she is and how acting focused she was so that was yeah so Bob was definitely the most challenging I don't think it will I don't think just you really think much of, else will top that because, yeah. just because of the language yeah you know you never know you might end up doing a movie in French then maybe you then, can, maybe, yeah, <laughs> then maybe yeah. you will the other thing I kind of wanted to talk to you about is because I think you've accredited uh, One Night Miami as being that one that sort of very much introduced you to a lot of audiences here mm -hmm. but you were a working British actor for mm. a long time, and I think I'd seen you in Peaky Blinders first. I'm curious, looking back on sort of like the audition track, mm -hmm. is there one that you went up for, but at the time it's like, oh man, I really wanted it, but it actually ended up working out that you didn't get it. Like maybe it put you available for something else, or you're just like, oh, but the person that got is obviously perfect for it. Was there one like that on the audition That straight? got away? Yeah, that got away, yeah. You know, I don't think so. Mm. I think, I think, 
there are, there's been many moments where at the time when you find out it hasn't gone your way, it feels really disappointing. But my, I've been lucky because my experience so far has always been a year or two later, you look back and you go, I'm glad that I didn't get that because mm. this happened. So, I mean, and it happens all the time because the good, good roles and good scripts are very competitive. So when something's good, it's not just going to be you who wants to play it. So like, you know, it's not, it doesn't always, you, sometimes the good stuff goes another way. But I feel like, yeah, I feel like that's just a part of it. And then you, you have to learn to just make peace with it really quickly and realize how lucky you are even to be considered for it or even to be, do you know what I mean? You just find a way of just being grateful for just having hands and fingers and toes and something else will come, you know? That's a very British answer. Almost maybe even American. That's almost an American answer. Be like, bright side of life on all of it. Oh, no, but I, ha I have my moments. Like, <laughs> I have my moments where I'm like, mother <laughs> Okay, all right, please. Yeah. Thank you. I'm like, yeah. be human. I'm like, Yeah, no, on. no, I don't know. That's what I'm saying. In the moment, it feels like that. And I have like, I mean, a few months ago, the yeah. part didn't go my way. And I was <laughs> like, what? Two of them, actually. Oh, man. Um, Sorry. Okay, good. I'm what I'm saying is, in a year's time, I hope I'll look back and go, that was ah, right. wasn't meant for me. I'm sure, I'm yeah. sure you will. I mean, listen, you've been, you've been a booked uh, and busy individual. I want to make sure we can't get out of here. I want to bring it a little bit back to Bob Marley, and mm -hmm. because we didn't talk about Lashana Lynch, yep. your partner in crime in this. See you now tomorrow. Oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because y'all are doing uh, stuff for the film right now. And I want to talk about that because... I think maybe it was the advertisements or maybe just my naiv naivete. When I finally sat down to watch it, I was so surprised at how romantic it was. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's right there in the title, but you're thinking one love, like, you know, the mm -hmm. music. And so that part of it, what y'all were able to do with that, I, 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 I'm glad that Paramount put this out and did that big push for Valentine's Day, because it is right. probably one of the most earnest love stories that mm. we've gotten this year. Mm -hmm. um, talk about crafting that with her. We met early. Lashana auditioned me for the film. And she, you know she's Jamaican. Her whole family's Jamaican, and 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 it was so funny because all of her questions and things that she was unsure about and wanted to make sure and be sure were all the things that I felt as well. Mm. So we had we met up for a coffee, and I, I think she, yeah, we were just on the same page. And then it was about as like, look, we now have, now we're really ahead of the game. We've got six months. So how can we? sort of contribute to this starting from now. So we just, we, we were just talking all of the time about Bob and Rita and trying to find ways to, because it was a, com it was a very complicated relationship. Yeah. And like, we wanted to make sure that you feel the love and the connection and the history when it's not, when nothing's being said, you know? And like, how do you do that? And some of the scenes were rewritten, you know, like some of the big scenes, the scene in the room, mm. the scene on the street, you know, our, our relationship was really, really handled very, very specifically from the beginning because the writing was still in process. We got to set and we, we had all of that time together. And then on set, Lashana was just, she was a rock to me, you know, like, and I always felt so safe with her, I'm mean, safe, we're safe, when no one's dying. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, but no, emotionally but like, safe. This yeah. is like, you know, vulner a vulnerable moment. Yeah, yeah, and she understood the qualities of Bob that I was trying to keep, because Bob's not, it's I always say about Bob, like you can't, you can't put Bob in a movie, no one saw him cry really, do you mm. know what I mean? He was a tough man, so like, trying to hold that nuance of that and letting like his emotional world feel internal but still guarded and like how much it costs him by the end to have that hug and to let go is very very true to him and very true to the stories you hear about him and, and Lashana understood that so like we were just we were just able to play and what she did with Rita was just so like She's top, top draw, man. She's yeah. top, top, top draw. You've been blessed to, I think, have some uh, incredible scene partners um, in general. Uh, is it truly, you went to drama school with Michaela Cole, correct? She was, Michaela's year below me. The year below you. I'm curious for you, um, you seem to be somebody that is 
wanting to always continue to harness your craft and maybe do different things. Is there any like collaborator that you haven't gotten the chance to work Not with loads, uh, uh, that you would, or maybe a specific genre you want to approach? Like what haven't you gotten to do yet that you're inching to do in your next chapter? I mean, chapter? to play like, just to play a, like a made up person. <laughs> Just play a, ma play a made up person who's on some sort of adventure that's made up. Okay, you play uh, too many icons. I see. Yeah. You're like, I want to play like yeah. just a dude. Okay. But I feel like in answer to that question, it's the um, it's following good writing. You know, and mm. good writing can be good writing can be any genre, and it can be any role, and it doesn't need to be the lead role. It can be a supporting role, and and so it's. I think the first question is always like, is the script good? But if you're really lucky, you get to go like, is the part good, is the script good, and is the director great, you know? And then it's triple. Mm -hmm. so. Is there a director that you're like itching for, if you can? You've had, you know, you've had, a, you've had some pretty yeah, fun I'm people happy, already. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, yeah. is there anybody you're like, oh, I would just, they're, they're the filmmaker that I admire, so I'd want to do their work. There's a few, yeah. There's a few. I know. The actors think it's a jinx to mention it. I'm, yeah, I get it. I get if it. I say it's not going to happen. I know. I know. Look, not, I get it. I get yeah. it. We'll just pretend we know. You could tell me after. It's cool. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Kingsley. It was great. really great to chat with you Likewise. about everything. And uh, good luck on the awards tour. Thank you so much.